along the far frontier. From the blue bonnet prairies of Texas to the mountains, California way. Those hard riding sons of the saddle do their duty night or day. Their fame has grown in every place they're known. Along the far frontier, they stand for right, and for their cause they'll fight, if trouble should appear. When the history of the West is written, to the world it will be clear. There's glory in the story of the border patrol. Hector is the acting division uh, chief for the Rio Grande Valley sector of the Border Patrol and a 31 plus year veteran with the U.S. Border Patrol. So I know we're going to receive some very good information concerning the migration situation on the border and any other information he'll impart to us today. I'm not sure we'll have time for questions. That's up to him uh, and uh, in our time uh, with for today's meeting. So without further ado, Mr. Escamilla, thank you so much for being here. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for having us here on behalf of Chief Parrish for allowing me to come out and uh, thank you all for the work that you do and try to answer as many questions as I can. I'll, I'll try to keep my briefing a little short so that we do have some, some time for questions and so on. I hope I'm not interrupting your lunch, so uh, I'll try to take it slow here so that some of you can finish it in case you do have some questions. So uh, a little bit of background on me. I'm, I'm, I was born here with Cal. I've been in for over 30 years, uh, mostly between Texas and Springs, all the way to Brazil. I've never been outside of Texas other than for a uh, few months at a time here and there. Uh, but nonetheless, I've, uh, I've, I've been around quite a bit and seen a lot of different things, different migration patterns, different trends throughout the course of the years. And we're definitely having one that's, uh, you know, having a big impact on not just us, the, the Border Patrol here in, in the Rio Grande Valley, but nationwide, and it's having a big impact on our communities also. Uh, so I'll start out with giving you all an idea of what we face day in and day out as far as our area of responsibility. Uh, first of all, here in the Rio Grande Valley, we're about 3,100 agents strong. Sounds like a lot of agents, and it, and it is, uh, but we definitely could use more. Uh, especially in, in this particular time of need. But those 3,000 plus agents really dwindled down quite a bit when we got to go and perform our own training at the academies. We're, we instruct our own agents at the academies. We support headquarters in Washington uh, with a lot of personnel for statistical data reports that need to be done. And just a lot of different things that happen throughout the course of our day-to-day -day operations. Agents are responsible for also uh, managing our budgets and our you know, operating costs, uh, acquisitions, and so on. So the actual people that we put out in the field after we grant people sick leave and their daily life routines of vacation really dwindles down to approximately half of that number on duty at any other time at best. So we covered 316 river miles from the mouth of the Rio Grande all the way to the Falcon Dam. That's, that's a pretty daunting task. A lot of the area that we cover is dense brush, of course, as you all know, South Texas. The lateral mobility is very difficult because a lot of the land that we patrol is owned by personal landowners. So we've got to go from one property to the next. There's, there's fence lines, there's property lines that we can't just traverse continuously along the river. And aside from that, there's refuge that is very difficult to traverse and very difficult for us to actually go through there even though they're a, a, a government agency partner. There's a lot of uh, policies and so on that prevent us from just going into a refuge and, and mowing the place down in order to make our job easier. So there's a lot of uh, 
cooperation that has to happen for, the, for us to be able to, to clear some of the land that, that we need to patrol. So difficult, uh, difficult area to traverse. Aside from the river miles from, again, the mouth all the way to Fountain <coughs> Dam, we're actually responsible for the uh, entire shoreline all the way up to the Louisiana border. So we do have agents in different places uh, along the coastline. And we do have a, a, a Corpus Christi office. So aside from the six line stations that we have, we do have the two checkpoint stations in Kingsville and Far Furious and the Corpus Christi office. So <clears throat> we do have uh, you know, a pretty good tactical spread of where we apply our agents. The majority of our agents are from the West Lipo area, out the Santa Ana Refuge, Progressive Port of Entry, all the way over to Star County. That's where we have the majority of our agents. And I'll tell you why that is. Uh, years ago, it was actually lopsided. As you can see here by the orange depictions, that's where we have most of our technology currently that can feed live pictures into the stations. That's where we have the most of our technology deployed currently, as well as fencing. We do have uh, almost 56 miles of fencing currently along the Rio Grande Valley. The baller fencing that you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with. Either you've seen yourselves or you've seen it in the news. So as, as the years went by and we started to deploy technology on our easternmost uh, part of the Rio Grande Valley, what used to be the hotbed in Brownsville has fluctuated out here to Star County and Western Hidalgo. That's where we have the least amount of technical, you know, tactical infrastructure, which is our fencing technology and so on. We've, uh, we've come a long ways. We've got some aerostats out there, which are those blimps that you see. They're very, very capable of providing us some great visibility, a great force multiplier for us. We have approximately four of those, and we do have one out there in Foul Furious that provides some help to the checkpoint stations. They've got a, a, a very vast uh, capability uh, as far as a view shed on what we have coming at us, but they're also limited. That technology can't see through the dense brush. It, it's not a catch-all. So uh, again, back to the uh, you know, the, the, the harsh terrain that we have out there. Uh, it, it's tough to get, you know, visibility even with that, that particular type of technology. Aside from that, as you all are very familiar with, with our environment here, we, we have very windy conditions, so we can't keep those up very often. At best, uh, combined, we get about a 62 and 65 percentile on, you know, the time that they're up in the air. The rest of the time, they have to come down and we have to you know, safely put them down on the ground so that we don't lose them and damage the, uh, the, you know, the equipment that's on. So, and it's very expensive. We don't own it, we have to contract it out. So it is costing us a pretty penny to keep those five limbs up in the air. So currently, um, again, we are going through a phase of trying to improve our capabilities. You guys, I'm sure, again, have seen it all in the news from here all the way to the Beltway in Washington to fight for the wall. Those are some of the things that are currently happening out in Stark County. We're, we're, uh, we're starting to make a little bit of, of uh, leverage with the communities there, uh, working out some cooperative uh, agreements on what would be best for the communities there, landowners, as far as where to place the wall without displacing families and so on. So we are in some good uh, communication with with the local uh, local folks in the communities out there, so some of those uh, some of those funds have already been appropriated in, in the Dalton County. So you'll see some fencing already starting up to supplement the one we currently have. So uh, I'll talk a little bit now about the mass migration and the numbers that we're seeing right now, uh, currently, with the family units and unaccompanied children. So our apprehensions are up well over 100 percent from last year. We've apprehended already about 165,000 people to date uh, for the fiscal year, which started October 1. That is pretty significant. And on top of that, our apprehension for uh, other than Mexicans has gone up about 150 uh, percent. So it's it's been a tough times. Uh, the humanitarian effort has really taken away our ability, at, you know, time-wise and, and manpower-wise, to, to be able to concentrate on the adversary that um, we would rather you know, concentrate on as well the narcotic flow, the flow of the people that, that come here that, that have the, the criminal histories behind them and so on and so forth. 
But unfortunately, that is part of the tactic, and it is a big income uh, for the cartels to bring these family members here. They don't come here and, and uh, drop them off on our doorstep for free. Uh, in fact, they, they take full advantage of the fact that they know we're going to care for those people and we're going to do our best, you know, to perform the humanitarian effort. And, you know, it, it is literally a tactic to tie us up so that they can go around us and flank us with, with other commodities that are a lot more dangerous, you know, to the public. So, I'll, I'll show you guys a little bit about what's going on in some of the depictions here. This vehicle here, we're getting these uh, float across us. They're actually vehicles that are already fully loaded with narcotics and they float them across on these makeshift rafts with 50-gallon uh, drums and so on. So as soon as they hit the U.S. riverbanks on one of the dirt roads out there, it's loaded and ready to go and they don't waste any time. So we're seeing that a lot. Even out there in, in the uh, eastern flanks, near Brownsville and Harlington, where we actually do have the, uh, the visibility on camera and and some of the wall. Of course, once they hit the riverbanks, we you know we don't have somebody at every crossing point. It takes them seconds to minutes of disappearing to the neighborhoods or into the farmer market roads, pay streets in the in the city limits, and they're gone. But fortunately, our camera systems are giving us a good heads up, and we're able to interdict some of that. Checkpoints seeing more and more, you know, of, of uh, huge numbers coming across in tractor trailers. This fiscal year, there's been a big spike of uh, apprehensions in tractor trailers, refrigerated trucks, so on and so forth. We've been in groups of hundreds at a time. And I'll give you an example. Last night in Stark County, out in the Roma area, we got a group of 180 at one time that were dropped on our riverbanks of women and children in one, in one particular group alone. So, you know, imagine the amount of manpower that it takes uh, to, to just watch over this group of folks, because not all of them are, are your, um, you know, economic type of, uh, folks, economic migrant uh, folks. So it's, it's a mixture of, you know, some, some people with criminal backgrounds, women and children. So very dynamic, very, very difficult scenario to manage when you've got, you know, children that are unaccompanied, family units here, bad guys there. How do you separate, separate them out in the dark? So it takes, it takes a lot of our manpower, and you know, we do have pretty good intelligence resources that are telling us while this is going on, they're flanking us, the public is gone, and uh, giving us information that we're having a very difficult time addressing because we're having to deal with things like this. When we have been successful, uh, this was in the news, we had a, a pretty successful apprehension of some cocaine, uh, almost 750 pounds of coke a few, a few months back in the Star County area. Some of the equipment we discovered there, uh, very high tech type of equipment that was, uh, had been deployed against us at, at that particular area. Uh, cameras that could detect us, equipment that could detect any one of our radio communications, and so on and so forth. So they were very well prepared. The place was very well guarded. And uh, UTVs that were being used to take the narcotics from the river over to the residences in the area. Uh, so they dumped that in the water when we chased them. They were equipped with caltrops, which is a makeshift uh, piece of equipment where they, they uh, weld nails together and throw them at us when we start chasing them to flatten our tires. So, um, so those are some of the, the challenges that we see uh, aside from the migration problems that we have right now. Uh, of course, another thing that, uh, you know, that they use quite a bit is uh, UTVs that can traverse through tough terrain and uh, when things get pretty bad for them, they just dump them in the river full of the narcotics and sometimes with the people still in it, if it's not a narcotic load, it's just a human trafficking load, they'll dump it in the river and the, and the folks will try to get out and swim for the, to, to safety. And that becomes a big challenge for us because instead of an apprehension, now, now it's turning into a rescue for us. But we do have some pretty good coverage from our marine operations folks that help us help us out with that. Some of you have heard of our Boar Star agents. Uh, there are an EMT group, specialized group that we have that uh, they traverse the, the vast lands out, especially in the ranch country. And uh, you know, aside from their normal routine of going out there and actually, you know, looking 
looking for apprehensions and so on and so forth. They're well equipped to perform rescues and provide first aid and IVs and everything else. So we, we have these folks deployed, especially in the hot summer months, you know, trying to, you know, trying to help out the, the northern uh, checkpoint stations that we have. A lot of MS-13s, unfortunately, that doesn't make the news quite a bit, but some of the, the folks that we do get uh, come with a, with a long history here in the U.S. and sometimes you know, we're able to have good communication with their countries of origin and they provide us with some good feedback on, on some of the criminal histories that have occurred in their countries of origin. So uh, some, some pretty concerning uh, backgrounds on some of the folks that we do catch. So, you know, back to what we did uh, purposely, and I will say purposely, uh, tied up with the family units. You know, we've got people like this guy in, in the runaway vehicle. Those are the ones we want to catch. They may not be as plentiful as the family units, but these are the ones we'd like to concentrate on, and it's very difficult to do uh, currently with the big numbers that we're seeing with the, with the family units. You guys probably saw this in the news of two days ago. Got that, uh, that toddler that abandoned the sugar cane out there and uh, you know, left, left the abandoned out there crying. Unfortunately, we found him. They scribbled his name on his shoes and a phone number to call. You know? So those are some of the things we're seeing quite often. You know, the, the cartels are ruthless. Uh, these people ain't coming for free. Be rest assured that nobody comes across without paying a hefty price. And unfortunately, they take advantage, you know, the cartels know that we're going to send them forward to these detention centers, and we're bound by policy and law to only detain them for a certain amount of time, and then they're going to walk. So be rest assured that even after they walk, and, uh, you know, they, they traverse into the northern part of the United States with, with their documents in hand to go see the judge and wherever their final destination may be, uh, they're going to continue to keep uh, being exploited even even thereafter because uh, you know again we we conduct very in-depth interviews we've got really good intelligence on what happens after they're let go uh, cartels have different cells throughout the entire United States where they continue to be exploited for money uh, or you know obligated to work for free or for very low wages in different places you know despite the fact that they released them on the riverbanks they're they're still following tails or, or their final destination. And so very difficult times that some of these, these folks are experiencing as far as the exploitation is concerned when they come here. Um, kind of hard to read from here, but there's a <clears throat> communication between cartel members to cartel members on, on how they're trying to take advantage of the migration. And again, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist for these uh, uh, cartel folks to realize that we're actually, because of our policies and so on, uh, you know, helping them out with their efforts, if you would, because they know that we're going to pick them up from the riverbanks and take care of these folks, take them to these shelters, and the exploitation on their part continues because uh, they're taking advantage of our, you know, of our policies, rules, and regulations. And, and uh, what we do thereafter when we catch it. So again, it's easy for them to follow the flow and make money off of that flow, but based on what they know we're gonna do thereafter, you know, in, in our humanitarian efforts. So that's, uh, again, very difficult for us to do our job on, on trying to target the, you know, the adversary, the cartels, uh, you know, when they, when they tie us up uh, with, with such a huge flow that we're currently experiencing. We've been averaging somewhere between 4,000 and 6,000 people uh, that we have in detention day in and day out. We've had some, some weeks where we're averaging 9,000 apprehensions uh, on a seven day period. So pretty, pretty heavy flow. And one of the things that we have difficulty with, not just in our day to day uh, encounters with them, but the detention thereafter. We've only, we're, we're only supposed to be a temporary facility at each one of our stations, but we've been forced to have to do more and more because the agencies, our sister agencies that are supposed to support us with detention and removal, they're overwhelmed. And they're even uh, worse staffed than, than the Border Patrol is, unfortunately. So it's difficult for them to keep up with the pace. So we're having to hold on to them longer than we should. 
and uh, overburdened our detention centers, which again are really made just for a 24 hour period. And currently, you've heard of the facility that's going up over there in the Dow Port of Entry. We're probably going to have to man that with a lot of more patrol agents also. So that's just an emergency overflow because currently we are exceeding our, our detention capabilities by far day in and day out. So, so those are some of the things I just want to kind of skip through. And I'll take some questions if you guys have them, uh, you know, as best as I can. Yes, sir. The OTMs, the, the, they call that other than Mexicans, sure. you said it's up 150%. The other is 165,000 to date since October. Mm -hmm. uh, other than a percentage, I, I know that oh. there's been reports that people come from as many as 44 countries. Yes. Even overseas. And overseas, was, yes. Uh, is there a way to put a number on that rather than a percentage? Like of that 165,000, uh, maybe 2,000 were. It, it, yeah, I don't have those numbers exactly, but the majority of the of the OTMs are from the Central American countries of El Salvador, Nicaragua, um, Guatemala, Honduras. So those are the ones that are predominantly the the, you know, the numbers that uh, are feed the OTM category. You hear about Asia and even Europe and yes, Eastern. we've caught Middle Eastern folks here. We've caught Iraqis, Iranians, uh, a lot of Chinese. Uh, Chinese are more Common that people might think Pakistanis, uh, Cubans too. I hear Cubans, you. we're catching Cubans, uh, but so, so we've got a few. Uh, did they take them with them? Some of the common countries, I think they took the other displays uh, with them. But some of the other common countries uh, are China, um, and those those bring large amounts of money for the cartels. Wow. Yeah. So up to you know fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a person. So. You know, we, we've done some research and some, uh, some estimates, so we estimate that the cartels are making as much, if not more, money on the human trafficking than they do on the actual smuggling of narcotics currently. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, you mentioned several times and stressed the importance of technology to what you're doing. Yes, ma'am. You're undermanned, you need the best technology you can get. Now, the best technology is the 5G technology, but I'm wondering if you have it since 5G does not work well in sparsely populated areas, and you're dealing in sparsely populated areas. So, do you have the best technology, which is 5G, and how do you do it when you, have, you don't have a dense population area? Well, there's this new rollout of technology that we're supposed to get. I'm not 100% <coughs> familiar with whether it's 5G or what capability it has, but it is above and beyond what we have out on the east side, which is already 15 plus years in existence, from Brownsville to approximately the western side of the, of the uh, Willacy County area. Um, we do have some great towers, military grade type towers that can give us pretty good visibility also. But some of that technology isn't all, you know, all that uh, we could probably get as far as up to date, because if you have one tower go down in between the chain of six or seven, that kind of breaks the, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, technology or the transmission, I would say, of what we could see on down the line. So it's almost like a daisy chain reaction. If one tower goes down, they all go down, so yes, there's, there's definitely some, some major improvements to be had. Uh, but we do have some folks from the technology part of what we do, the scientific part of our offices uh, at CBP here, analyzing all of that and, and trying to do a, an assessment on what's best for this particular area. Again, Rio Grande Valley area is very difficult to, uh, to address as far as the topography, the geography. Unlike some places like Arizona, New Mexico, where it's flatland desert, and you've got really good visibility, and the transmission of, of uh, all the technology is a lot easier. It's a lot more difficult here because of the terrain that we have, for sure. Yes, I have a question. If it's true, the children uh, that are coming, that sometimes they're reused. Yes. Do we keep up with that so, so we see the family that are coming that the same child has been used again 
And again, are we keeping up with that? Okay, very good question, ma'am. In fact, there is a, a, uh, an uptick on, on the fraud cases that we're determining nationwide, not just here in the Rio Grande Valley. So normally we won't, we won't uh, fingerprint or photograph because of policies, children under the age of 14. But we can if we have to, and we're starting to have to use some of, uh, some of the laws that, that do govern us and be, having the ability to, to identify some of these uh, children. And so we're finding more and more fraudulent cases. We have a team dedicated from our intelligence departments uh, these are our plainclothes officers that are more investigative types instead of enforcers out in the field. And uh, we have them dedicated to st strictly interviewing people, family units that we identify that we see some signs. And we're discovering quite a few cases. Uh, the new uh, Secretary for Homeland Security was here just a few days back. And that is one of the things that he wants to really have us concentrate on. So there is an effort to improve upon that. And some of the statistics that we're discovering as far as the fraudulent cases are alarming. So, uh, yeah, that is, it's definitely something that's happening. And we're going to keep a, you know, cl a close eye on that. We're going to try to start pushing for some, um, uh, some court cases to come out of that. You know, we're going to try to prosecute some of those folks and you know, see if we can use that as a deterrent. Because it, it is definitely something that's. Uh, and start to get more and more rapid. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So there's been changes at the top, changes in policy Definitely. by the president. Mm -hmm. How is that impacting you? And is it top, bottom, or bottom up? Are they taking any of your advice that you're right here, you know, where the act, so called action is? Do they even know what's going on? Yes, they do. That's, uh, you know, right now, again, there's, there's a lot of controversy, you know, uh, at the higher levels with you know, the opposition to the wall and, you know, and so on and so forth. But it's not all about that. One of the things, again, right now that we're really trying to uh, bring to the forefront is the exploitation of these family units and the amount of money that, 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 that that's bringing to the cartels, you know, um, and the, the, the exploitation of the children. It's definitely something that's happening. We're trying to gather as much, as much to the statistics as possible, and again, trying to bring that to the forefront to the assistant U.S. attorney so that they can help us uh, push that message up to the beltway so that we can at least make some ground in regards to that. Because if we can eliminate the mass migration of families and children and the exploitation of them, and we'll be able to concentrate on doing more of the border security work that we want to, uh, you know, that we want to concentrate on. But there is there is some big help. Uh, again, uh, Secretary McElhaney, who was our CVP commissioner, and now has been moved up. He's very engaged. He was just here a week ago, and uh, he's very well versed with what's going on, and he's trying to do his best uh, and giving us his support. So we're seeing some some strikes. We're hoping to, to see even more so here in the next few months. And he listens? And he listens. Yes, he does. Yes, ma'am. Do you see these people staying here in the community? Okay. Instead, you mentioned going to other places that maybe the cartels are still extorting something from them when they go someplace else. The majority of the folks that we encounter that uh, come in, their, their ultimate destinations are uh, the interior of the United States. And mostly uh, northern, seems like uh, northeast coast, so on and so forth, but some of them do go to the west coast. But when they commit to the Rio Grande Valley to enter, most of them are pretty much going to the eastern coast. Uh, the ones that enter out there towards the desert areas of Arizona and California, they tend to stay out there. I think that, that kind of, uh, you know, pretty much determines which, which entrants are going to take. But sometimes it, it, that's not the entire reason why they come in, you know, Rio Grande Valley versus Arizona. It just depends on which cartel gets a hold of them. Not just in the interior of Mexico, but the cartels extend all the way to the Central American countries. They have their, you know, their cells out there too. So it starts way out there. Hey, look, we're going to go to the RGV. These are the people that we can contracted with, so we're coming in through McAllen, 
Rio Grande City, so on and so forth. But the majority of them uh, do not stay here in, in the uh, Rio Grande Valley. You're fighting an uphill battle, almost as reminiscent of uh, the early stages of the Vietnam War, when the four soldiers over there were fighting something that, uh, you know, they, they were, they had their hearts all in it, but didn't have the resources. Uh, I hear a lot of conversation about uh, uh, high tech uh, application. Uh, it would appear to me that we haven't really recognized the fact that northern Mexico is a failed state, that the cartels control everything that goes on, and that they're the ones that are managing strategically uh, what you're fighting, and you don't have the resources, you don't have the, you're not as well funded as they are, uh, and whatever we come up with in terms of technology, uh, they're using these pawns, and coincidentally, I flew out of here a couple of weeks ago, and there was a young boy sitting next to me who was one of about 10 kids from 10 to 14 years old, that were flying someplace, they were uh, unaccompanied minors, the poor kid was totally traumatized. Obviously, he'd never been on the And uh, I felt so sorry. There were two Catholic charities, uh, people that were ushering about 10 kids in, in on this plane. They did a marvelous job, and it's a thankless job. But we really don't have the resources or, we'll, uh, or want to acknowledge in the United States that the cartels are controlling all of this. You merely are putting, trying to put your finger in the dike, and that's what I feel so badly about. You're putting your lives at risk, you're putting your finger in the dike, and there's no way that you can fight the cartels. And, and as you say, they're in Honduras, uh, El Salvador, and, and they're bringing all these people up. So I just want to make sure that you, you know that we thank you. The poor kid that I stood next for, he's a post or road next to, He's just a pawn in this. I felt so sorry for the kid. Didn't speak a word of English, obviously. I will elaborate a little bit on, on, on the control and the power that the, that the cartels do have and, and, and the strengths that they have that they have versus the Mexican government. And, and it is alarming. If you talk to some of the residents out there in Star County, for example, especially in Roma, you can see the firefights going on on the Mexican side at night. You can even see uh, the flashes of of uh, the ammunition in the air, so on and so forth. It's, it's alarming, uh, and it's you know it, it, it's pretty discouraging to to the local folks there because a lot of them have some some close family ties that go on for generations on both sides of the border. Good family ties. Unfortunately, there's some bad family ties, and that's what draws a lot of the um, cartels to the area. A lot of the you know the illegal activity there because it's so isolated uh, from both you know. Uh, not just the main uh, government agencies in, in Mexico City, but even the local garrisons and military that, that are capable of facing the cartels, they, they have a hard time getting out to those areas and, and, and managing that. So, so it is alarming that out there, it, it is a no man's land, but uh, you know, not just us, but the local law enforcement folks out there, and you know, in every one of the counties here, you know, <coughs> Cameron Willis Hidalgo star. Uh, our local law enforcement partners together here on the US side anyway, I think we do a really good good uh, good job on, on forming the coalitions and working together and we've really, really improved upon that in the last several years. I'd say five years ago. We probably didn't have that cooperation, that daily liaison, and we do now. Uh, we get a lot of great support from the cities of Roma, Rio Grande City, Star County Sheriffs. Uh, in regards to making sure that, at least on the U.S. side, our communities are safe. If we look at every one of the cities, in fact, uh, you know, surprisingly, you would think uh, Rio Grande City and Star County rank pretty high up there in regards to some of the safest cities in the U.S. as far as crime rates being low and so on. But it doesn't take a fact, you know, take away from the fact that on the Mexican side, it's a very volatile situation, and there is generations on, on the you know, on, on the bad side of, uh, of, of things that are uh, just long-standing and, and it makes it difficult for us to infiltrate some of the, you know, some of the networks there because they hold uh, a lot of strong connectivity on both sides of the border. So, yes, yeah, big concern. But I will say that 
Um, Mexico is doing a lot better job than government of Mexico in communicating with us daily. We do have uh, immediate uh, communication with them within minutes to hours. And um, in, in many cases, they have shown up in numbers. But it's, it is difficult for them to show. They'll, there's places where they'll flat out tell us, we can't go there. We don't have a stronghold there. We'll be outnumbered. It's like walking into certain death. So uh, there's some places where they, they just don't have the, the manpower and the ability to come help us. But they are getting better as far as their communication and cooperating this with us. So as far as the, the border security piece. Yes, ma'am. So, what do you know since you said about the um, n a number of people coming in? But they put in the news about that beast for a reason coming in on that train. Yes. It's, it's a two sided question. That and then is that Donna Tent City full? Or what's the story on that as well? Okay, so so that train they called the Beast La Bestia. It's, it's been in existence for years. Why the government of Mexico can't stop the train, take the people off? I don't understand that. I can't answer that question, but it exists, and the photographs and the, the film clips that you see on the news are, are absolutely correct. That is one of the, the main uh, travel uh, conveyances that, that some of these Central American folks use, because it starts way out in Guatemala, and the mexican Guatemala border it traverses through most of Mexico, and along the way they can pick certain locations where they do finally get off and pick a route of travel. And, and uh, align forces with one of the cartels that will bring them all the way in. Yeah. So as far as the tent city, um, that is going to be a contracted facility. Again, it's going to be an overflow because currently we are exceeding our capability uh, to, to an extreme um, at each one of our locations. And our, our uh, fellow partners with uh, detention and removal or removal folks and even um, Health and Human Services can't keep up with us, so we're trying to find overflow space, at least temporarily, until hopefully through policy, which is really going to be the key, is for you know our lawmakers to change policy, allow us to deport people easier, quicker, and able to detain folks for the amount of time that we need necessary to make the determinations of asylum and so on. If that doesn't happen, that this is this is going to continue. So those are some of the things that are keeping so us from. Over there in John, that tent city's not open yet? Not open yet. It's, it's scheduled to open in the next few weeks. I'm not sure what the day is. Do you do? No. no. But it, it, it should be coming in the next few weeks. Yeah. So Will that help with the whole respite center and, and that problem that we have over here? Probably not. Probably not. I mean, we will still continue to see the releases um, from a lot of the, the uh, board patrol stations because the folks from ICE are not able to keep up with the process themselves on removing the folks. After 21 days, we can no longer legally hold them, not us, not ICE, and unless they have criminal histories and so on, then uh, we're, we have to resolve to releasing them out the doors to the respite centers. We're trying to communicate with the cities where we are releasing them to with the respite center and uh, Sister Norma, but uh, even then it's difficult to you know, talk to them about every single person we're going to release. Some of these folks are starting to become a nuisance, and unfortunately, to the communities, uh, you know, a big burden on the communities, you know, not just financially, but uh, with some of the, you know, health concerns that they may bring, and so on and so forth, so. And what about some of those people, sorry, that's my last question. <laughs> what about some of those people that, uh, from different, like Washington State, that said that they would be sanctuary cities, I mean, are you being able to transfer some over there, or not? Well, we're, we're here to talk about that, but we haven't been given any guidance or direction in regards to that. No. Okay. Yes. Sir. Could you explain how uh, asylum works, what, what the law requires and what is optional? I'll give you a, um, what I do know about it. So the majority of the folks that come here, they, they come from economic hardship countries, and that's usually what they tell us. Uh, as far as the reason what, why they're fleeing. There is a lot of, uh, you know, for most of those Central American countries, a lot of poverty, a lot of uh, gangs, violence, MS-13s, and so on. But again, uh, an asylum process and, and, and the reasons for asylum should be specific to the individual. Did the cartels, did the gangs in their country of origin specifically target them for whatever reason, for political reasons, uh, et cetera, and not so much 
there's an economic crisis in the country, right? But yet that's, uh, those are some of the reasons being used, and in some cases, some of the reasons being approved, and so on and so forth, some of the factors. Uh, so they're trying to clarify that. We're, we'd like to see where asylum officers are more accessible to us, actually, at Border Patrol stations. In fact, there's talk of Border Patrol agents having the authority to listen to the asylum claims ourselves so that we can expedite the process. But of course, that's being met with a lot of resistance and uh, probably it's gonna be met, if, if we do go into that endeavor, it's gonna be met with a lot of uh, uh, lawsuits and you know, uh, court scenarios. So, good question. Yes? I think I may ask an additional one. I talked to a gentleman yesterday who uh, kind of, he's a citizen guy that watches the border near Brownsville. He estimated that you need about 4,000 new agents and that when you're stationed along the border, you should be about a quarter mile apart, give or take, and always have two agents per truck, never have them alone. Do, do those numbers and scenarios make sense? Um, it, it just depends. Again, um, I couldn't tell you that it would take 4,000 more agents to control the area here, but the more agents we have, the better. And some agents are very well adept, and you know we're well trained, and we can work alone if we have to. It is always better to, to have a partner, but usually, we, even if we're alone in, in, in a vehicle, we're never going to address the situation on our, by ourselves. The next closest station will always give you the support. Um, but what we really do need is a lot of different factors, and, and again, one of them is policy. Until we start returning some of these migrant families and children back to the country of origin quickly, uh, so that it'll make it more difficult for them to make a second, third trip, unfortunately, for, for those you know that, that have the need for a better life, but. You know, as you all well know, uh, you know we're here to, to support the world, and, but we can only do so much. So until we start to you know change policy and allow us to again do our job easier in regards to the deportation process and the asylum cases being expedited, then uh, I don't care how many agents you give us, it's it's just not going to do us any good. So there's got to be a change in policy. There's got to be a change in in some of the laws and. Uh, and so on, and some of the communication and, and state departments, that, that's huge too. So we gotta communicate with the, the, the heads of these countries in regards to why can't you take your people back quicker than, than what you, you currently do. Because it's a really slow and strict process on being able to return somebody back uh, to the country of origin. A lot of it has to do with consulate officer communication and so it on. It sounds like we need to know a lot more about what's driving them out of their countries in the first place, because that's the font or that's the fountainhead of the whole problem. Correct. And right now, again, it's the Central American countries, but what's next, right? The next next country that gets into a crisis, those South American type scenarios we're seeing, that could be next. So right now we're being overburdened by you know, three major countries, really, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. So if we get that kind of influx from a few other countries, we're going to be in an even more difficult situation. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, sir. When, when somebody claims a, uh, asylum to a border patrol agent, what happens to them? Who hears, who's the ultimate hearer of that and decide? We have an actual cadre of uh, CBP employees, DHS employees. They are actually asylum officers. That's all that they do. There's just not enough of them. And it's hard for them to, to listen to thousands of people, not just the ones coming into the Rio Grande Valley, but nationwide. So they're deployed across the country, these asylum officers. And they do have a specialized training. But it's not something that really cannot be condensed into us having the, uh, you know, as Border Patrol agents, the main training and the main facts and, and facets of what it takes to make that decision. So that would be a huge win for us if we could start to either have asylum officers multiplied and accessible to us a lot easier or, or give us the authority to conduct some of those interviews ourselves and, and make those determinations ourselves. Do you have a question, Matt? Okay. Yes. Um, do you know if there is anyone at your upper level that has connected with um, a senator or representative or someone with a re recommendation for a policy change? Is that in the works in the background? Man, they come here all the time. But, but, but they take pictures of From both sides of the spectrum, you know, on both sides of the, of the parties. And we tell them, we give them more in-depth briefings than I'm giving you all. 
because we can say a little more to our, to our, to our lawmakers, right? Uh, so there's small strikes happening, but again, they're, they should all be well aware of, uh, you know, how we stand and uh, what we're facing here. So yes, we tell them all the time. So. Yes, sir. Uh, I've understood that uh, in terms of drug apprehensions, uh, that you only uh, interdict about uh, one seventh or one tenth of the, uh, and they says an estimate of the drugs that you, you're able to actually catch. Is that is that a current statistic? Is there still uh, nine tenths that's, that gets through, especially with the diversions uh, that you're having to face today with uh, all of the uh, undocumented uh, migrants? Well, I, I can't speak to the exact percentage that we may or may not be catching of the entire flow that comes into the border area, the border region here in South Texas. But I can say that this fiscal year alone, we are down almost 40% in our narcotic apprehensions. And I would venture to say that a lot of that is because of the rise in the migration that we have is keeping us too busy to concentrate on the other part of it. So the you know statistics pretty much show that right now. Our apprehensions for narcotics are down, and our apprehensions for our um, family units and the unaccompanied children are way up, so I think they, they correlate for sure. And I could conclude that instead of one-tenth, maybe it's a half of a tenth that you're apprehending in, in the mass majority. Again, uh, back to the number, not sure. You know, we'll, we'll say that uh, on any given fiscal year, we think we're at 10 percent at, at our best. Uh, on some years, we think we apprehend more than, than than other years, based on intelligence we get from uh, Epic and different law enforcement agencies, intelligence agencies out there. So our, our effectiveness rate fluctuates from year to year, and again, a lot of it is based on what's keeping us busy. If we have the time to address the narcotic flow, we've got some again really good um, relationships with our. Uh, local, state, and federal law enforcement partners, and in some cases with the government of Mexico, but hard to address when we're, when we're facing the other, the other dilemma. So, I think that was missing something. Uh, would you comment on the efficacy or the changes that have been made during the Trump administration for the past two years? Has there been any assistance to you? And what do you anticipate if the politics change into a Democratic party in the state? <laughs> Joe, you want to take that one? <laughs> um, oh. I asked the general a difficult question once, and he drank his coffee, walked out, and didn't come back. <laughs> but no, uh, several changes that we've seen under this new administration have been uh, very, very helpful, very effective. We are getting the. Uh, some of the funding that we needed, but again, uh, you you know you're all well aware of, of the struggles on, on both sides, on both parties. So as soon as we get some relief as far as funding, you know some policy changes that are in our favor, um, they're met with court challenges and so on and so forth. So a lot of the you know a lot of the things that we are benefiting from under this administration, uh, uh, they're they're kind of short-lived at times, right? So. For example, this humanitarian crisis with, with the, the detention and removal of folks and the overflow, we had a very similar and, and uh, it's been surpassed under this, this current situation in 2014. Some of you all may remember that scenario. I used to walk into my detention center in Westaco. I was a commander there and uh, my capability there is 215 folks that I can detain. I had four to 500 people in the area, and we currently are back to those stages now, just lying around wherever I can place them. So when we finally got the attention of that administration, uh, they sent us an army of folks to help us, you know, DHS folks, FEMA folks, and some policy, policy changes happened, some communication with Honduras happened on that particular occasion, which was the country that was giving us predominantly the most problems. They started accepting back family units on flights quickly, expeditiously, and it stopped. But they sent us, a, a, again, a team of folks that opened up an emergency operations center in our headquarters in Edinburgh. And we had 
people representing every CHS, every CVP component, DHS component you can possibly imagine. And things got done. They got done quickly. Nobody challenged him at that particular time, President Obama. Got, rightfully so, he gave us all the support we needed. Uh, opened up an emergency budget, declared an emergency scenario, and things got done. And levels went back down to normal. We were able to go back and, and concentrate on, again, more of the criminal element that we would like to concentrate on. This particular time, of course, you guys have seen that try to declare an emergency, and, and uh, nobody's, nobody believes uh, it's starting to come around, but again, everyone's challenging the fact that there is a current crisis happening, and we're not getting the support that we did under the prior administration, again, because of the, you know, uh, the struggles that are happening, you know, politically at the higher levels. So, what would happen if we went back to another administration of a Democratic president? I'm, I'm not sure. I don't want to predict that. Thank you so much, Chief Escamilla. We appreciate your time. I have one final question. If anybody wants to say afterwards, please do, because we want to finish up the meeting. What about the disease that we're hearing? There was a story the other day about some Ebola, some detainees that possibly were carrying Ebola and maybe other things. What is the process on that, sir? What's really happening with that? So we, we do have um, screening that, that happens at a few of our detention areas, uh, the McAllen Station, uh, on military, the CPC, the big detention area over there on Ursula and where, and Westlaco has uh, full-time physicians assistants, uh, doctors and so on available to screen folks. And those who do complain, and it's quite often, aside from the preliminary help that we have there physician-wise, we, we take them to the hospitals or emergency rooms around, <coughs> around the valley uh, to check them out. When, you know, again, they they give us a complaint on their own behalf or we notice something through our own doctors or through our EMTs, our, our own Border Patrol personnel. And we are coming across a lot of concerning scenarios, anywhere from TB to uh, Ebola to uh, simpler cases like lice, scabies, uh, chicken pox, measles. Uh, so, well, you can imagine all these folks coming from these third world countries, not just Central America, but again, Bangladeshis, Russians, Chinese, uh, a lot of them carry a lot of different things that we don't see here. Uh, but they're not being often. released if they're carrying some kind of like a bowl. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't answer that question on how much, we, we won't detain them unless the health, the county or the health department says we need to keep these people quarantined and in-house and that's their call. It turns into something other than a border patrol decision. But we, uh, we right now statistically I can't tell you those people are eventually released or not. So depending on, on how serious their, you know, their disease may be. But the, there is a lot of concerns and oftentimes our agents are falling ill quite often with the, you know, with, with the mass migration for sure. So. Thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thanks again. I hope I answered uh, any questions. I'll try to keep this part in brief, but um, I really appreciate all your questions. I hope I... I was able to answer uh, as much of them as I could with clarity. But I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit. You guys have a few more questions uh, as we pick up the go. From the blue bonnet prairies of Texas to the mountains California way, those hard riding sons of the saddle do their duty night or day. Has grown in every place they're known along the far frontier. They stand for right and for their cause they'll fight if trouble should appear. When the history of the West is written, to the world it will be clear. There's glory in the story of the Border Patrol. Along the fall.